Um, great to have you on, Tim. It's, I, I think this is a very good color that we can give our viewers on what's going on in the region and also at the Semicon Southeast Asia because your MOU with A-Star Institute of Microelectronics. Just walk us through the thinking and what is the implications going forward in terms of the region's growing role in the industry? So first of all, great to be mm. here, great to be in Singapore. Um, we're excited about this MOU for two very important reasons. You know, one of them is the power that innovation in areas like advanced packaging have for our industry. And so all of the discussion about AI and the advancements you're hearing about, none of that would happen if we don't continue innovating in advanced packaging, which is really the theme of this MOU, play a critical role uh, in that. But the second thing that's exciting is how important this region is in innovation. And a lot of people globally think of the region as a manufacturing powerhouse, a, you know, a great part of the global supply chain. But innovation isn't always the first word that comes to mind. But for us, it's the opposite. This is the heart of a lot of our R&D, and this MOU is really part of that. Mm, and I actually went down there to, to look at some of the exhibitions and country pavilions that they were getting ready. And uh, the, the, the trend that I've noticed, and correct me if I'm wrong, that a lot of uh, Western chip companies like you uh, coming to Singapore for this event, trying to meet with uh, some of the suppliers in uh, advanced packaging as well as the uh, testing equipment manufacturers. So these Asian companies are actually trying to sort of, you know, fill in the gap when it comes to the global supply chain with the back end part of the story. Is that the trend that you are seeing? By the way, first of all, I think of us as a global company, and we have our roots as much here in Asia as we do anywhere. Global uh, company, yeah, absolutely. but with the Western root. Okay, let uh, me put it that sure. way. And, and, and so, no, I think you're hitting on a very important topic, mm. which is the industry is changing, and these partnerships make a huge difference to how we innovate, and no one company can do it alone. Mm. To bring a complex semiconductor device to market, whether it's for the cloud or for the edge, you need a whole host of innovation, you need a whole host of manufacturing partnerships. And so when you see companies in packaging and test, collaborating with companies in chip manufacturing and design and IP, it's really because all of us are necessary to make it happen. How does the uh, Trump administration's uh, tariffs and all these uh, trade policy uncertainty uh, impacting your business? Because you're heavily manufactured out of the U.S. Is it helping your business, perhaps? Yeah. So we have a global manufacturing footprint, and I think the reason that that matters a lot today is what's been happening in the last six weeks has been obviously unprecedented. It's something the world hasn't seen for a long time. But it's really, in context, part of a longer-term trend that says the world needs more regional manufacturing. It needs more diversity. Companies need more options in where they make their chips. The chip crisis of 21-22 also proved the vulnerabilities in the supply chain. And so, in many ways, this is just the continuation of government saying, I need to do more to incentivize a rebalancing of the industry. And for us, with a strong manufacturing presence in Asia, in Europe, and of course in the U.S., it really is a good chance to give our customers that option. Do you feel like you're going to be paying more attention to this part of the world, given the trade-related uncertainty and this trend of multi um, multi pieces of regionalism perhaps yeah we have some of the most innovative customers around the world in this region you know the whole of Southeast Asia including also China we see also huge amount of innovation coming out of China as well as in Europe and the West yeah. and so this is very important for us and it's an area we engage a lot with and you know just as you mentioned earlier the MOU for advanced packaging is a good example of why we'll be doing different things here that we would not consider to do before just given that kind of vibrancy uh, in the local ecosystem so we'll be, we'll be here a lot I'm here a lot uh, and definitely see more potential you mentioned to China let's go there because I just wonder how your assessment as yeah. you know Chinese uh, competitions in foundry business how they've come up so much in the value chain and that has been really the narrative are they still years away from where you stand or are they making some remarkable strides because I think the street is very divided at the moment I think definitely opinion is, is divided the way we see it is China today in 2024 imported maybe 380 billion dollars of semiconductors and so a lot of the development you see in China is really to reduce that import you know, dependency that China has on the rest of the world. And a lot of that capacity is what we would call bulk CMOS semiconductors. So areas that we don't typically spend our time uh, on in terms of uh, competition, we focus on the differentiated technologies that really make a difference in those applications. And we have Chinese customers driving in many ways those applications, not just for China, but for the global market. So I'd say for GF 
actually I see China more opportunity uh, than a threat. But obviously it's a market we spend a lot of time in to continue to watch what's going on. Yeah, and of course, the narrative has been around China that it's been really the low end of some of the legacy uh, chip making that they uh, they might be making some strides in, but it's not really there when it comes to the advanced um, AI related to chip manufacturing and so on. What's the gauge that you're getting on that front when it comes to some of the advanced stuff? Well, clearly it's a national priority for China to continue to advance in a lot of areas. China takes the AI race very seriously, and you've seen announcements coming out of China around both chip development, but also uh, development in the data center, you know, also by end users and model developers. Um, so I think that will continue. Uh, where we see the opportunity really is those differentiated technologies that are needed to enable a lot of that, like in radio frequency, transmitting data over vast distances and so on, which is areas we play more in, uh, and we see those as being still very needed. Since I have you on, I do want to just get a very clear confirmation on these reports suggesting that you're talking to UMC in Taiwan, potential acquisition, some kind of merger. Is it happening? Did you think about it, talk about it? So obviously I'm not going to comment on, on, on market rumors. You know, we have a very clear strategy. We have three pillars we're focusing on, being the best in differentiated essential chips, building deep partnerships with our customers and our ecosystem around the world, and then really turning this global footprint that we have that spent more than a decade in building into a global advantage, which I think is particularly relevant today. And so if we find M&A opportunities that will help accelerate that strategy, we'll do that, and we've done that before. Last year, we acquired a company named Tagore Technologies to enhance our gallium nitride roadmap, which is a very interesting area of development. So we'll do more like that to develop that roadmap further. Yeah. Would it make sense, though, with a Taiwanese a company, given the geopolitical complexities at the moment? Yeah. I'm not going to comment on that specific company, but yeah. But would you pick a, co a company in areas like Taiwan, given the geopolitical challenges? You know, as global foundries, it's in the name. We take a very global view on our partnerships. Uh, and so, you know, even from an M&A perspective, there definitely could be opportunities in this region. More broadly, it won't be just limited to one region that we'll look at. Okay. Let's talk about demand picture. Um, not too bad, but is there anything that you see in terms of weakening in the mobile segment? I think that was the read that I was getting in the latest earnings report. A lot of uh, trade-related, tariff-related headlines that could actually make consumers think, okay, maybe I hold off on my next purchase. Maybe I will wait it out a little longer with the next car or the next phones. Is that what you see happening? With semiconductors powering so much of everything we use every day and everything every business uses every day, semiconductors will follow the global economy. And for sure, everyone is waiting to see, is there an impact on consumers of really the uncertainty that you talked about earlier? Um, and so it's hard to say how that will play out. We definitely don't see a very strong year in areas mm -hmm. like mobile. But on the other hand, we see very good growth in areas like the data center, where we have a significant number of technologies playing. So it's not a uniform picture across end markets. And we sure. definitely see some very bright spots in the industry. Mm. How is AI, as a mega trend, affecting your business? And it's such a generic question that I asked you, but I wonder how your business changed over the last maybe five years. We had that chat GPT moment. Did you feel the difference in your numbers? Did you see them? I think you see it in two different ways. You see it internally and externally. Okay. I think internally, obviously, we're already using AI, using machine learning in many ways to be a more efficient company. We deploy incredibly interesting innovations in our factory floor. You know, just 20 minutes down the road here in Singapore, we actually have our dedicated digital manufacturing team building predictive models to how to use our tools better. So AI is shaping us very much internally. Of course, it's also shaping our markets. The data center has been the focus of a lot of that for the whole industry. I think we're really excited about where and AI truly moves to the edge and to the end point. And that's where you're going to see use cases that really unlock value for all of us, right? When your device can do an AI application natively, locally, that's where you're going to see an explosion of the use cases of AI. Mm. Talk to us about how, you mentioned this briefly, but talk to us about how AI is changing your company internally. Because I'm trying to figure out how this is going to impact, not just as a semiconductor company, but just companies across the board, how, not just about the job layoffs or anything, but how is, do you feel the efficiency really just getting a lot of boost at the moment? 
you know, there are different kinds of use cases, and I think, you know, we talked about some of them in the manufacturing floor, but also in areas like the enablement we provide for our customers doing their designs, the tools they can use so they can get to market faster. These are going to make a huge difference to our industry and definitely to us uh, as a business. But I think for all of our employees, they feel it. And by the way, I would say the newer generation feels it the most, and they're the ones hungriest to deploy AI, AI in their daily workloads. And, you know, I use it personally every day, maybe 10, 15 times. I ask all of my leaders, do you do the same? Are you challenging yourself? to actually have a partner in your AI co-pilot to really actually challenge you as a leader, think through strategy, mm. think through communication, think through so many things. Mm. I think we're just at the very beginning of that journey. Yeah, I feel like we need like economists coming up with like AI gauge, not like just trade balance that we talk about every day, but the sort of AI specific gauge of what's going on in terms of productivity. You and I will meet again later this afternoon for the CEO summit and obviously the theme really just captures the essence of what's going on in 2025 a lot of a uh, trade uncertainty and how the supply chain uh, challenges are going to be resolved here what's going to be really the main theme going for uh, 20 uh, go going for your uh, ideas for supply chain related issues yeah. I think you're gonna hear and you heard it already this morning in the yeah. in the in the in the seminar um, it's a hugely positive future right we're all optimists by nature we all think about technology as a force for good in the world around us and I think we can easily get confused by the short term in terms of short term demand and, and, and uncertainty mm -hmm. but this is a growth industry that really is transforming lives transforming how we work and so on so I think you'll see across that panel later on today pretty good optimism across the board but you know within that optimism is a question are we ready are we ready for the growth that will come? Are we ready to partner in different ways? If innovation will take five companies to make it happen, do we really know how to work together in groups like that globally in a world that's more fragmented? How do companies get ready for that, though? I think it's about establishing great partnerships, right? Mm -hmm. Because we can't do it all. How do we find partners who are willing to work with us? By the way, from the equipment side to the packaging side we talked about, to the substrate inputs, we'll talk about those as well. And so there's a lot of the ecosystem that needs to collaborate. Mm -hmm. And of course, it starts with dialogue like events like this. Exactly. Collaboration, Absolutely. of course. Uh